Well, good evening, everyone. I am uh, Clark Irvin, the director of the Homeland Security Program here at the Aspen Institute, and accordingly, I'm the director of the annual Aspen Security Forum. Uh, welcome to the fourth annual Aspen Security Forum. Our goal when the forum was conceived some years ago was to make it the nation's premier forum for exploring homeland security, 
counterterrorism, and related national security and foreign policy issues. And I hope that you'll agree that we're well on our way toward achieving that goal. Over the next few days, you will hear from some of the nations and the world's leading policymakers, policy executors, and pundits on the host of security challenges facing us in the post-Bin Laden era. As the attacks this past year in Benghazi and Boston underscore, Bin Laden may be dead, but Bin Ladenism is not. Our special thanks to our 2013 sponsors, Academy, AGT International, IBM, Microsoft, Raytheon, Target, and the Robert R. McCormick Foundation. Our thanks go also to our media partners, the New York Times and CNN Security Blog. And finally, tonight's opening session is made possible thanks to the generosity of Tom and Bonnie McCluskey, who graciously sponsored the McCluskey Speaker Series. With that, it's my pleasure to introduce Tim Baer from one of our sponsors, Target, who will formally introduce tonight's program. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Clark, and good evening, everyone. Uh, I am Tim Baer of Target Corporation, and I'm truly honored to join Clark with Clark in welcoming you to the fourth annual Aspen Security Forum. This is my second year here at the forum, and I'm really glad to be back, back with uh, the leading experts in this field who are so open and willing to share their perspectives on topics of great importance, really to all Americans, including Target, a seller of toothpaste, T-shirts, and TVs. <laughs> now, it may not be immediately obvious to you why we're so glad to be here with you tonight to talk about this topic, even if it is true that we aspire to sell even more toothpaste, uh, t-shirts, and TVs to everyone in this room. Uh, but that's not why we're here. At least that's not how we pitched ourselves when we first talked to Walter about this. So supporting the forum is one of our investments in a larger portfolio of investments in safety. The other investments include store-level security personnel and camera systems, the kinds of things you might expect. We also operate 14 investigation centers across the United States where we build regional and national cases. And we also operate two forensics labs, fully accredited, and the interesting note there is that a full 30 to 40 percent of the capacity of those labs is donated to the community to work on cases unrelated to target, and the demand is so high for those services that we've had to limit the cases to violent felonies, but we're glad to serve the community in that way as well. And why do we invest in safety to that degree? Well, it does help us deal with the bad guys. And that's incredibly important because our guests and employees, if we don't provide a safe environment, will choose to shop and work elsewhere. And if they do that, sales and employment will decline because the bad guys are winning and the community suffers, the entire community. We like to do business in strong communities. In fact, we do better when we do business in strong communities. So we have a clear interest in this. And we're not concerned just about criminal behavior when it comes to safety. Mother Nature's disruptions, earthquakes, hurricanes, flooding, and fires can greatly impact our business as well. Retail is on the front lines of helping our communities prepare for, respond to, and recover from these natural disasters. Think about it. We have the supply chain, the supply chain capacity, and the consumer reach to be effective in that role. 30 million Americans uh, execute a transaction in a Target store every week. That's connection with the community. So in short, we invest in safety because it's an essential part of our retail brand. It's really about that simple. So we take our responsibility very seriously to protect both our business and the larger community. And what we've learned along the way over the years in which we've been engaged in this type of investment is that one of the best investments that we can make is to partner with law enforcement and other public safety officials in the public sector, people like those you're going to meet during this forum. And by partner, I mean that we expect to contribute to as well as benefit from those relationships. So we at Target appreciate the opportunity to engage with and learn from all of you here at the forum, which is why I'm very eager to hear from our keynote speaker this evening, General Welsh. And with that, I'll ask you to join me in welcoming John King, Chief National Correspondent for CNN, who will get us started. John? You didn't know the general was here to sign a big procurement contract with Target, did you? <laughs> uh, 
Th thank you for having me, and uh, I think I speak for the general as well. As thank you for letting us escape uh, beautiful uh, the autumn weather we're having back in the nation's capital at the moment. Uh, I'm not a military expert by any means, but my first encounter with the Air Force in any extended way was back in Operation Desert Storm. Operation, the Air Force carried me to Dahran, Saudi Arabia, as a member of the first Pentagon pool that went in there. And uh, the weather was about the same there as it is in D.C. now. Um, I spoke briefly to the general yesterday, and uh, he said the only thing he wanted to talk about were the men and women who serve in the Air Force. Um, so should we go in alphabetical order? Um, no, but, um, uh, let me, just a quick programming footnote. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to talk to the general for oh, probably about 30 minutes here, and I'm going to try to raise uh, some of the long-term challenges for the Air Force and for the military and for the country. I'll also talk about some of the topics that I think are in the headlines uh, today, or at least in recent days, and if not today, maybe tomorrow. And then we'll open up to questions from the floor. And when we get to the questions, I'll just say this up front now, it's just easier if we have questions, not speeches. Um, you're all veterans of this environment, so I think you know what I'm talking about. Uh, and uh, I'd like to have as many questions as possible. You have, we have a lot of people in this room who are a lot smarter than I am about these issues, and it'll be a more engaging conversation with the general if we get to your part of it. So I'm gonna run through some topics first, and I wanna start uh, I want to start with an issue that's a big deal in Washington. We talked a little bit about this yesterday. Uh, you've got an expert group here, so go beyond what we see in the talking points. And when it comes to sequester and furlough, uh, what is happening today that hurts, uh, that is harmful to you? Not something that you can make go away with an adjustment here, an adjustment there, but when you look at a three or five year trajectory for what you're trying to do for the force, worries you. Thank you, and thank you for letting me be here. This is uh, an unbelievable thrill for me. Uh, I'm going to introduce one person to you before I start. We'll see if he thinks that in 45 Let's try that minutes. again. We're, we're a service founded on technology and innovation. <laughs> I just don't understand it. <laughs> Let me introduce somebody to you real quickly. I want you to meet my wife, Betty, because she's right here in the front row, and she's going to hate this. Stand up and wait. Uh, kind of my view of the Air Force starts with her. We've been doing this together for 35 years, and she needs me for absolutely nothing. <laughs> She's smarter, better looking, uh, much more physically fit, and, uh, and kind of advises me on how to treat people in this business every single day. Now, she's magic. Uh, if you get a chance to talk to her tonight, you'll figure that out. Um, sequestration's been fascinating for us. It's, uh, I think everybody has a view of it and an opinion of it. The biggest things for me are, on the sequestration side, before I talk about furloughs, is that we have four major accounts of money in each of the services, and the Air Force is no different. We have people costs, we have infrastructure facility costs, we have modernization costs, and we have readiness costs, flying hours for the Air Force, maintenance money that goes with those flying hours. We have had a great amount of difficulty recently doing anything about the infrastructure and facility costs. We can't seem to get to a point where we can reduce those. It's been a very difficult struggle. We're still pushing. We have not been able to reduce the people costs. In fact, the people costs have gone up exponentially over the last 10 years in a very dramatic way, and it's very difficult and emotional to get at them. So where we've been driven by sequestration is into modernization and readiness. Those are the only places we have to take money from. And the accounts, because of the mechanism of sequestration, are all hit a particular amount in each account. So, for example, on the readiness side, we get, we get our operations and maintenance account cut. In that account are flying hours, maintenance money to support the flying hours, civilian pay, things like that. And so the flat rate cut just took the money out of the account. It wasn't that we chose to take that money, and we don't have authority from Congress to transition other money into those accounts. We have to go ask for that specifically, and we get it sometimes, but not as much as we would like to have right now. For good reasons, if you're the Congress, by the way. But that's caused the problems. We are trading modernization against readiness. It's the only place we have to go for funding because of this abrupt, arbitrary mechanism that is sequestration. And it's causing a real problem on the readiness side of the house and putting our ability to modernize over time at risk. The furloughs are a specific problem for us for a couple of reasons in my mind. The first is a very human reason. Uh, we have about 180,000 civilians in our Air Force. Those civilian airmen are integral to every mission we do, and in some cases they are the mission. They're the entire workforce. Uh, we are now furloughing roughly 150,000 of them for 20% of the rest of the fiscal year. Most of them are not very senior people. They're lower wage scale employees. 
they are going to have trouble making car payments, insurance payments, paying for skids, kids' uh, piano lessons, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, all the things that you know you have to pay uh, as a family member and, and somebody who tries to run a life away from your job. And that's affecting them dramatically starting last week. They're impacted today. From a corporate perspective, what furloughs mean to me as the chief of staff of the Air Force and to the secretary of the Air Force is that between now and the end of September, we lose 70 million man hours of work time. That's going to leave a bruise. Answer, before I move on, answer the skeptic who would say, okay, but nothing bad has happened. You've got some stress on people's lives, uh, but nothing bad from a security standpoint has happened. Therefore, uh, you must be getting too much money to begin with. You must be too big to begin with. Well, two things, John. First of all, we know we have to be part of the solution. So the idea that the Department of Defense has to cut its funding over time is clear to all of us, and we're all on board with that. The problem is this, this arbitrary mechanism that we've got, because we have to hit that modernization readiness account hard the first two years in order to make the 10-year sequestration cuts, because we can't get rid of people or infrastructure or force structure fast enough to pay for modernization in the first two years. So the, co the cuts are going to come in modernization readiness. It's like everything else. If you can't decide which product lines to close, which business areas to downsize as you build your, your uh, ramp down, you're going to do it in a very uh, nonsensical way. That's where we are today. Uh, and so th I think that's the concern. On the, re on the operational side, there have been impacts. We've prioritized everything that we know about. So operations in Afghanistan, uh, full up combat capability in Korea, the nuclear support mission. We, we're doing all those things fully uh, as we did before. We've put all our money there. If a squadron is going to deploy to Afghanistan on the next cycle, we keep it fully trained. It's all those other units that are not in those categories that we have stopped flying, some completely since the 1st of April of this year. Uh, or we've limited their flying and just got basic currencies in those units. It includes space units where radars have been operating n less hours a day than normal, which puts a little bit more risk into the, uh, the missile warning business, although we think we can manage it. Uh, everything has been impacted in a way that's below the sight line of most people. But if something new happened, we'd be affected dramatically because our ability re to respond quickly is affected. I want to get in deeper into the nuts and bolts of these specific challenges in a minute, but when you look at your portfolio, and you have a pretty significant cyber portfolio. You have, as you just mentioned, the space portfolio. You have nuclear deterrence. Uh, in all of those areas, um, you are, as is everybody in the business these days, increasingly relying on outside contractors. Uh, with the whole Edward Snowden thing in the news, a lot of people are scratching their heads saying, you know, what do those contractors have access to? How are they watched? Um, how are they screened to begin with before they get those jobs? Uh, what lesson have you learned in recent weeks, and what are you doing different today that you might not have been doing, say, six weeks ago or eight weeks ago um, to, to police that better? Yeah, I would say it's probably a lesson relearned or a lesson that we should have learned. Uh, the big thing is, first of all, we have lots of contractors working for the Department of Defense, Air Force, and other services, and they do phenomenal work for us. So I don't, wouldn't categorize this as purely a contractor problem. It's a problem with access to classified material with people that you're not sure will safeguard it properly. We had the same problem with uh, the private manning trial that's just completing, I believe, now. Um, we've, we've learned it multiple times in, in cases that weren't as highly visible or as uh, known by the rest of the population. And I think the key is just control access to information. Everybody doesn't need it. And you have to very carefully vet people who have the skills to operate on your networks because we know the cyber domain is now a huge vulnerability, as well as an opportunity. And in terms of the safeguards, uh, do you have in place already, or have you gone back and checked? I think it was a surprise to a lot of people when you heard the NSA. You might understand this in the first year or two after 9-11, when a lot of this was new and people were urgent and rushing. Uh, but 11 years later, say, well, I guess maybe we need to go to the buddy system. Uh, so that there's somebody watching. To, you know, so there's not one person can't do this on their own. Uh, are you confident that on, on your end, the, the people who report up through you, do you have those safeguards? I, I'm confident that we have the safeguards. The problem is, I think NSA had the safeguards. Uh, I, I, the, the issue is that we've got to pay special attention to exactly what happened here, adjust the safeguards uh, as indicated by the facts of this particular case, and then move on. You know, we, my first exposure to cyber, you know, bad cyber activity was when I was the executive officer to the Commandant at the Air Force Academy back in 1987. The Commandant's name was, a guy, was Sam Westbrook, great guy. And we were there when they put the first uh, internet, in, intranet actually, into the cadet 
uh, area there at the Air Force Academy. And the senior cadets were the first ones to get laptop computers. And so they just hooked up this new Falcon net on a Friday, got it ginning. The commandant got his computer on Saturday. He was a Rhodes Scholar, by the way, in plasma physics. So he and I had a lot in common on the technology <laughs> side. <laughs> But, but he had hooked his computer up over the weekend, and on Monday morning I walked in, and he just said, come in here, you got to see this. And he is in there responding to emails that cadets had sent him over the weekend. Now, at the time, they were sending him emails like, hey, General, we need to have a cadet wing beauty pageant because, you know, cadet in fourth class so-and-so really looks good in a blank, you know, and having no idea that he could tell who they were. <laughs> <laughs> and so he was responding to them with things like, hey, I'd love to come by your room number, and he'd quote it, and talk about that, Bill, you know, <laughs> let's get together. This has been a problem from the first day, and we've got to continually work at it. Um, another issue in the headlines has been uh, the response by the brass and across the military to sexual harassment, sexual assaults. Um, what lessons have you learned, and why is Senator Gillibrand wrong when she tries to pass legislation that says, you know what, we either have to minimize or, or take the brass out of this process? Uh, well, I, I don't think, I wouldn't classify G G uh, Senator Gillibrand as wrong. She's passionate about the topic, which is a wonderful thing. Um, this is a, an issue that we have got to partner with the Congress. We've got to partner with victims advocacy groups. We've got to partner with universities and experts around the country. We, we have not solved this problem ourselves. Just a fact. And I don't care who else has the problem. My problem is the United States Air Force. Last year, we had 792 reported sexual assaults. The real number is higher than that. I, I don't know what the real number is. According to our surveys, only about 17% of the people report it. So you can figure the number out from there, roughly 2,000 maybe in our Air Force. But we know there were 792 because they reported it to us. Um, the, the trauma of this crime is to the entire institution. Now, the, the, if you take a look at one victim, not 792, just one, and you look at the pain, the suffering, the lifetime of anguish sometimes, the follow on medical care, health care, impacts to the family, the unit, the friends, this is horrible. And multiply that by 792 times, and it's appalling. So for us, this is not a, a, a spike in activity. It's about a change in the way we do business. Across the spectrum from trying to screen for predatory behavior to deterring this kind of conduct from those idiots who become criminals in this regard who, who might not technically be, be sexual predators, violent predators, but they put themselves in situations where they take advantage of other people. Um, all the way through reporting, victim care, follow-up, education of the force. There is an entire spectrum of things that we're trying to do uh, and it's not a matter of seeing how we do for a year. It's changing the game. That's what we're trying to do. And, and help me understand, so you take the big picture where you know, all of your colleagues in the other services are sitting in a room saying, we need to do this as the bosses. Uh, but then you each have your own individual cultures. Mm -hmm. uh, the Air Force, for example, has had women in prominent roles, I think was it way ahead of the curve in, in that regard. I remember back in the Desert Storm days of you know, seeing Air Force female officers in those days. I told you a funny story yesterday about a Saudi offer, a financial offer for one of your offices. I won't repeat in a public setting here. Um, uh, but uh, uh, how, how is it, so you have, a, you have an urgent Pentagon-wide, military-wide question and challenge. And then what about your particular subset? Is there anything unique and different, maybe for the better, maybe for the worse? I, I don't think so. I, I think we're all dealing with the same problem, and, and we're all approaching it in the best way we can. I think the one thing we all share is we're not experts in this business. None of us are. This isn't what, isn't what we do. We are not professionals in, in sexual assault and the prevention and prosecution of it. We have experts in our service who, do, uh, who are experts in investigation and in prosecutions. We have experts in victim care, uh, but we don't have a lot of senior leaders in the services who grew up focused on this issue. And so we have to partner with a lot of different people to make sure we get this right. I'll tell you this, nobody cares more Nobody cares more about any single airman, sailor, marine, soldier, coast guardsman. Nobody cares more than their service chiefs. And, and any indication that the service chiefs, the chain of command, don't care, that's a misrepresentation. Uh, this uh, question has seemed to have lost its steam in recent days and weeks, but uh, lay it out in case it comes back. Uh, from a nuts and bolts perspective, if the President of the United States called you up and said, General, we need a no-fly zone over Syria, what would it take? 
uh, prioritization for the effort. It, it would take some time to do it right because some of the units we would use to get involved in that, some of the types of aircraft and squadrons we have haven't been flying. Um, and so we're trying to bring those back up on the step and get back to a, a ready stature as we find funding to do that. Um, or it would take an understanding that we are going to go anyway and we'll do it and we'll do it right, we'll do it well, but there will be an increased risk to the men and women who are executing the plan. And, and that's, to me, the danger of sequestration. I don't believe we should be accepting that risk. When, when you look at the strategic challenges, are you personally on the side that it doesn't add enough for the risk factor to help or on the fence on that question? I think it's a good idea. On Syria itself? No, I'm not voting on Syria. We, you know, we, we try every now and then. <laughs> we, we, we execute whatever we're asked to go do and we'll do it right. Um, the, the issue really, uh, uh, the specific issue of sequest sequestration is, is in places like Syria. Are we going to be fully ready to go get the job done? That's the question. We'll get the job done. Help me understand uh, your perspective and you start in any way you want and maybe I'll follow up with more specifics on what is the, the legacy in terms of what was lost? I'm sure there were a lot of lessons learned as well, some valuable lessons, but what was lost in terms of preparedness, modernization, uh, thinking about new threats, new challenges, new ways of doing things um, because of what you had to do and where most of the resources were dedicated in the last 11 years of Afghanistan and Iraq? That's actually a great question. You're pretty good at this. <laughs> no wonder I recognized your face. <laughs> that, was, that was the post office. <laughs> yeah. The big impact on the Air Force has been that our readiness levels have actually not just started to be affected by sequestration or by the Budget Control Act. They've been going down since about 2003 because of the level of support to the continuing rotations in Iraq and Afghanistan and others. Um, we had to back off a little bit on full spectrum training, the types of training we do out at Red Flag Exercises in Nellis, where we try and simulate the, the most con the difficult threat we can and, and train realistically against it. We've had to do much less of that over the last six to seven years. Uh, and as a result, the readiness levels just started to decline. The other thing that happened to us is we started to take money out of our readiness accounts and put, the, put it against modernization. The Air Force is old. Our aircraft fleet is older on average than it's ever been since we became an independent service, actually since we became the Army Air Corps, uh, and we're the smallest Air Force we've ever been. We have 329,000 people in our Air Force today before we get smaller, which we're going to. I came into an Air Force with over 700,000 people. And as we drew down over the last 10 years, we've cut about 2,000 airplanes and 30,000 airmen over the last 10 years in the period you're describing. And as we did that, those personnel costs went up, as I mentioned. And so while the top line budget went up, the force structure went down. That's never happened before. And so they'll come down together. As the budget comes down, the force structure will come down, and we'll go much lower than we've ever been before. And so that's what we're, we have to figure out what that means to us over the long haul. And uh, forgive the cliche, but you just mentioned it yourself, but in many ways, this, this is your father's Oldsmobile, right? Or your grandfather's Oldsmobile when it comes to your equipment. Um, do you see, given the financial fight you're in now, constraints you're in now, do you see a 5, 10, 15, 20, 25 year plan where you can be optimistic that, okay, that, here's where we turn the corner and this is tomorrow's Air Force, not retooling, trying to keep duct tape, keep yesterday's Air Force in the, in the skies? To some extent. Um, great analogy, by the way. I, the first thing I remember about my grandfather on my dad's side was him pulling up in front of his house the first time we visited him in a 53 Chevy convertible. It was sweet. It was green, it was white trim, a white rag top. That they thing- They computers though. You could work on them. You could find the carburetor well, and do it yourself. I, I, I couldn't, but you probably could have. The, he, what I loved about the car was that it was kind of him, but that car today would have an antique plate on it, and, and it'd be sitting in a showroom somewhere. When we deliver our last KC-46 tanker in 2028, we'll still have two-thirds of our tanker forts flying KC-135s that will be older than my grandfather's 53 Chevy. And, and your kids and grandkids are going to be flying them in contingencies and combat zones around the world. I believe we're better than that. Modernization is not optional for the Air Force. We have got to modernize. So we'll trade off other things in order to keep that going. A piece of the modernization effort is the F-35, uh, which is uh, controversial in some quarters. Um, cost overruns, which I guess are not atypical for a new weapon system. Uh, starting to come online, you told me yesterday in our conversation you're actually doing some training with them now. Uh, delays in some of the 
top scale software package. Uh, explain, uh, this is a sophisticated audience, but uh, so they may know anyway, but explain to the best, you were trying to make the analogy to me that uh, put a fifth generation fighter up against a fourth generation fighter, and why is it so imperative in your view at this time of tight money that you need them and you need as many as you can get? Because the threat will outdistance the fourth generation fleet, which is what we're currently flying, except for the F-22, within the next five years. And, and while there's lots of discussion of upgrading legacy airplanes to make them last longer, we can do that, but they will not compete with a fifth generation fighter. It, 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 the, it, there's an operational reality here that out where people fight and die, you can't get around. A fourth generation jet meeting a fifth generation jet in combat will be more cost efficient. It will also be dead before it ever knows it's in a fight. That's just the reality of it. And so the debate is how many, how much will they cost? We, we have got to figure out how to do this right as we move forward. But the option of not having the F-35 right now operationally, which is my job to explain the operational reality, operationally makes zero sense to the warfighter. You're, you're having that conversation in the sense of what you have and what you want versus your either adversary today or potential adversary tomorrow. Um, who is that? It's the, equipment the that's, it's the equipment that's been produced. The, the new fifth generation fighters, by the way, the reason they're rushing so hard to produce them in China and Russia is because this fourth generation versus fifth generation reality is understood by all of us, not just us. Um, within the next five years, we think both China and Russia will field a fifth generation capability. Um, it, it will not be, in my opinion, my personal opinion, as capable as the F-35, but it will be a fifth generation capability, uh, which will put our fourth generation fleet at immediate risk. And so, at least to some extent, we've got to be able to compete with that equipment. I don't think we're going to fight China or Russia in the next five years, but the reality today is that about 53 different countries around the world fly Chinese or Russian top-end fighters. Uh, so they do export these things relatively quickly after getting them into their fleet. So it's coming. Uh, this is like the tide. We just have to be ready for it. And that software issue, is it just a delay? Is it you need to redo it? You know, there's a conspiracy theory crowd out there that says, uh, you know, the Chinese must have stolen it, so you have to go back and redo it. Yeah, I, I'm, I'm not in that crowd. Uh, I, I think, the, I think the, where we are today is my successor as chief of staff of the Air Force, uh, in the perfect world where I don't get fired, <laughs> Before I finish my term, my successor, one of their first duties is going to be to announce initial operational capability and deployability of an F-35 squadron. We're, we're getting there quickly. The program for the last two years, despite all its uh, well-publicized struggles early on, has stayed steadily on track. Um, and the, the progress that's been made is good. We have 22 of them flying. We've flown about 1,500 sorties in the airplane. Uh, all the things you're hearing, software, helmets, et cetera, are technical things we have to continue to, to fix in the next three years. But I fully expect that the software will be produced in time by the end of 2016 for us to declare our initial capability with this airplane. Um, you said something interesting in our conversation yesterday that you know, you've been flying combat missions pretty much constantly. Uh, and support missions in the Middle East for 22 years. And a lot of your people really don't know anything else. Uh, yeah. What do you have to get through, uh, not just from a, a, a tactics, a mission, a orientation, but just a cultural thing within, within your force to either move people around, let them see other parts of the world, uh, teach them about different challenges, different threats, and I assume the Pacific is the top of the list. Sure. Uh, let me give you an example. We have uh, an AC-130 gunship squadron, Air Force Special Operations Command, a group that works for Bill McRaven and uh, U.S. Special Operations Command. Uh, the 4th Air Commando Squadron returned home to Hurlburt Field last Sunday for the first time since September of 2001. So the unit has been deployed nonstop since then. The people rotate in and out every four months, just like many of the other people who work for Bell McRaven. The commitment that that command and those airmen and the people and our special operators for this country have made to this conflict is absolutely stunning. But they just arrived back home. Uh, the operations officer, by the way, is a, is a lady who I believe has more combat time than any woman in the United States military um, flying time. Uh, but it's an incredible story. But they're going to have the same problem as the rest of our Air Force does as we back off in some areas once we withdraw from Afghanistan. The demand for Air Force and air power in our airmen is not really going to go away. Uh, we're going to still be doing intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance missions all over the world. We're still going to be doing an airlift mission every 90 seconds, every minute, uh, or every hour of every day of the year, which we do today. Uh, that's a lot of airlift, folks. 
Uh, and we will continue to do that all over the world. We're still going to have a, a whole bunch, about 15,000 space operators doing missile warning for the United States, making sure that war fighters, wherever they're deployed, have the ability to strike precisely, have the ability to navigate precisely, have the ability to communicate clearly. We're still going to have about 25,000 airmen doing the nuclear alert mission 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Uh, we're still going to have satellite operators flying about 170 different satellites and six major constellations around the clock all the time. Um, we're still going to have uh, airmen who are doing command and control and cyber activity, over 50,000 of them, who are operating 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Our Air Force does an awful lot of stuff behind the curtain that people don't really see. In fact, about 220,000 people out of our total force, about 220,000 of them, which is about 43% of the uniformed military, active guard and reserve, are committed to supporting combatant command activities every day from home station. It's a different model than the other services have. And as a result, most people don't really understand it. But we're not going to get less busy. You talk about that remarkable commitment of the last nearly a dozen years now of the people in uniform, of their families, uh, just as much, if not more so, uh, and the support, the contractors. And yet, when you talk about getting your handle on the arc of costs. Um, yes, you'd like Congress to have a functional uh, BRAC process so you can get rid of some excess inventory. That would save you some money, so you're not heating a building you're not using. Um, good luck with that. Uh, and, uh, but you also talk, and you know, Secretary Gates thought I was very candid about this on his way out, about uh, you've got to deal with the personnel costs, and you've got to deal with legacy health costs, and you've got to deal with legacy pensions, and you've got to go back to the question of pay. How difficult is it to raise those questions when you do have such an enormous debt, especially to the most recent generation. I'm not minimizing the debt to any prior generation. It's not difficult to raise the discussion because it's a math problem. We have got to raise the discussion. We've got to find a solution. The solution is difficult, and there's lots of different perspectives on the problem. There's lots of different technical views. There's lots of different opinions on the best way forward. But the most important thing here is that we don't stop the conversation because we have to solve the problem. We just have to. There's no other option. Or we'll be doing nothing but paying people in the next 20, 30 years. We won't be turning a wheel. Uh, well, give me your sage advice, then, as someone who doesn't have to run for office, who doesn't work in the Congress. Um, there are some current informers out here, I know, uh, who will take interest in this. But uh, you, know, you could have a great plan. And if the Congress doesn't like it, it doesn't happen. Your executive authority is fairly limited. Um, when it comes to the base closing, when it comes to changing, whether it's the personnel, the pay structure, health care structure. Uh, how do we get a process where people can actually have this conversation in a candid way in which they trust each other and they're not just about scoring points or protecting something back home, which are all protecting things back home are legitimate concerns uh, for a lot of these people. But how would you find the circuit breaker to start that conversation in a grown-up way? I don't think we have a problem starting the conversation, John. Actually, we're having the conversation. Uh, the service chiefs all believe, and the chairman believes, that it's our job to have the conversation and, and to offer very clear advice uh, to the Congress, to the President, to the Secretary of Defense on the impacts of either doing or not doing something significant. In this case, if you don't do it, the impact will be on those other things I mentioned, other things I mentioned infrastructure costs, modernization, and readiness. There, there's no magic bucket you go to to get more money. So those things will just be more heavily impacted. My job is to make sure we tell the story as clearly as we can about what that impact means to the nation. And for the nation, it's about choices. What do you want to be able to do to represent the United States of America? Do you want military options in support of other options the United States government brings to the table? Do you want them to operate independently? Or do you want to limit your military options for certain scenarios? Once you make those decisions, we can decide how much military capability we need. When you look at your portfolios, especially the cyber portfolio, the space portfolio, um, your new missions portfolio, uh, how do you deal with the definition of terrorism differently today than if we were having this conversation five or six or eight or ten years ago? You know, for us and for the Air Force, Bill McRaven have a very different answer than to this, I think, because it's much more nuanced because that's what he, he has. He has people who focus on that. His command doesn't focus on that. Um, but... In the Air Force, uh, the, the big thing for us is what are the domains we operate in and how do you have to support counterterrorism activity in those domains? We operate in airspace and cyber. Every mission we do, and by the way, our missions haven't changed since 1947. The ones we were given by President Truman then are exactly the same. Uh, but we now operate, continue to operate in the air domain. 
We operate extensively in the space domain and have added a mission of space superiority and control, which they didn't imagine in 1947. And now we operate in the cyber domain. And we do those same missions in and through it, just like we do through space and air. For us, what we have to determine is now that space and cyber in particular are becoming more and more and more contested and congested, how do we better do the missions that we have been trying to do in the air domain? And we support the combatant commanders in that effort, including Special Operations Command, including counterterrorism ac activity, primarily through our Air Commandos and Air Force Special Operations Command. For us, it's a matter of thinking through different ways to do the same job. And by the way, our FSOC guys are brilliant at it. They're really good at coming up with new and innovative ways to do business. Give me some specifics. When, I, I get what you mean, and we talked a little bit about this, but I want you to share with the audience when you talk about congested and competitive. Those, those environments, especially in the space and the cyber environment. How are they different today than a couple years ago? Well, I, uh, General Willis Shelton made some comments the other day uh, in, in a speech, and he mentioned that there were, he's the commander of Air Force Space Command, and he mentioned that there are now 500,000 plus objects in space. Uh, that's a bunch. And uh, one of the jobs we have is space surveillance. So our job is to try and track, catalog, and predict impacts of these 500,000 objects, some of which are very, very small, and some of which are much larger. Uh, the technology required to do that is changing. We have to get more and more uh, detail and be able to track smaller and smaller objects as the numbers increase. We have to figure out how we can actually adjust orbits uh, because now the commercial space industry has exploded. Uh, th there are thousands and thousands of, of things operating in space now. Uh, 1100, the, the latest estimate I saw was 2,000 to 2,200 satellites now operating in the most common bands in space. And so how do you operate in a domain like that, which used to be fairly wide open? It's kind of like the cyber domain where when the internet first started, it was pretty cool. Now you really got to be careful in everything from going to the ATM to sending an email. Uh, and so how do you operate in that environment, feel comfortable doing it, or be able to blend into it to create effects without people knowing you're there? And, and how much more? Uh, will the military, and specifically the Air Force as part of its cyber work, have to work with outside people when you, you have this threat where, yes, they want our military secrets, but they also want our corporate secrets. And so you've got sort of both or all of the above going on at the same time. How much of that is you got to just work on your world, or how much of that is let's reach out and touch people who are doing this out in the private sector who we can help them, they might be able to help us. Right. You're going to have Keith Alexander here later in the week, I, I know, and uh, he's, the, he's just a brilliant, lovable, patriotic geek. But, but he is a smart guy in this business, and, and, and he, he has spent an awful lot of time and energy over the last eight or nine years, actually, doing exactly that. How do we connect the Department of Defense better to the Department of Homeland Security, to industry, uh, to, to companies and people and expertise that knows how to operate in this domain, is really good at it, and can enhance our ability to maneuver in it or to support them in it? Um, the DOD national connection is going to be critical if we ever have to survive a real attack on our cyber infrastructure in the U.S. I'm not an expert in this, but everything we do in the Air Force is being designed to support Keith in that effort. Um, folks, if you have questions, please get ready. I'm going to ask one or two more of the general. Uh, we have some people with mics who will walk around. I'll get you in just a minute. Um, one of your old school missions, if you will, um, is nuclear deterrence and taking care of the arsenal. Um, where are you in that regard in terms of you've had the same modernization challenge and protection challenge and uh, in terms of you know, the reductions, you're a lot fewer today, but in terms of modernizing and the like, uh, how, much of, how much of your pie and time does that take? Actually, it's a, it's a number one priority for the United States Air Force. It has been for the last five years. It's very clearly stated, and we, we talk about it all the time. Um, and we have a workforce that is incredibly competent in this and incredibly dedicated to a very, very difficult mission. Uh, if you haven't had a chance to go see an ICBM missile field and see how people operate in and around it, it it's eye-opening. Uh, my, my example of the ICBM and the nuclear force in the United States Air Force is, is a, maybe a little bit different one than you'd have in mind. Mine is a young 19-year-old Airman First Class named Devell James. Devell James grew up in South Carolina in a single-parent family, and Betty and I met him when we were visiting F.E. Warren Air Base uh, in, in the last year. Uh, Devell loved his mom, and his mom loved to cook. So from the time he was, could walk, he was following her around the kitchen. He's an incredible chef. He's a missile field chef for the United States Air Force. That's what he does. And he thinks he's the most valuable guy in nuclear deterrence in the world. <laughs> because they trade crew members to get him into their squadrons there. He is the proudest airman I've met in the last year. 
And he is just this very straightforward, focused guy who comes to work at 4.30 or 5 in the morning in a missile field, stays there for five days, goes to bed about 8 or 9 at night, and starts over again the next day. And it is his job to take care of missile crew members, maintenance members, and security forces members. And by God, nobody's going to do it better. Uh, he is strategic deterrence in my mind, but that's why it works, because we've got 25,000 of them out there doing these missions. Um, and recently, when you had the, uh, tell me how it works internally when you process, you get the uh, volume turned up, I'll say it in a polite way, from North Korea. And so you decide you're going to deploy some forces as a deterrent, and you, you know, you can describe the assets that are used, which are clearly designed to send a signal. Uh, when, when that happens, particularly in that case, um, maybe there is no good real answer, but how much of it is you think, here he goes again, or here they go again, and it's just rhetoric, or um, it's not your job, I guess, to do the intelligence part. You're a consumer of that intelligence. How much of it is, you know, this guy's nuts or this guy's real? <laughs> I haven't met him. <laughs> Dennis I, uh, Rodman. I, I, you have to bring, we'll bring Dennis Rodman to next year's Aspen Institute. Yeah. yeah. Uh, we actually thought about inviting Dennis to a couple of things to talk to him about, about his buddies. Uh, it's a job. For us, it's, a, it's, the, it's the mission. You just have to block it. You know, we, we get, who he is when we get told, it doesn't matter who he is. If the mission is to, is to show strategic deterrence, if the mission is to be ready, if the mission is to move assets to be prepared to respond, that's, that's what we do. Uh, the, the policy that goes behind all this, really, um, as a member of the Joint Chiefs, I get the opportunity to communicate with the chairman, with the secretary, with the president on occasion, and give my personal opinion as a member of that group. As the chief of staff of the Air Force, I'm given a job to do, and my job is to make sure we're ready to get it done. Let me ask you one more before we go to questions. It's an inside baseball question, but uh, when you have this challenging time for all of the services, uh, in the past we've seen, you know, uh, competition, rivalry um, between and among them. Um, people making different cases to their friends up on the Hill maybe, or this committee chairman, or this guy in the White House. Um, it's going to exist in any organization. That's called life. Competition is part of the domain all of us play in. Uh, what is it like now in your experience? Uh, how, how much of that is there, or how much of it is, you know what, this is a pretty steep hill. Uh, if we do it all together, it'll be a hell of a lot better at the end. I think it's mostly that. I think we're blessed right now because we have a chairman who I think the world of. Um, he is not afraid to put tough issues on the table. He's not afraid to have very difficult, honest conversations. Uh, we have a group of service chiefs who I admire tremendously. Uh, I did, by the way, offer to arm wrestle Ray Odierno for force structure. <laughs> that was the first time I realized just how big Ray Odierno re really is. Maybe I'm not a good plan. Uh, but the, the service chiefs, I think, respect each other. Uh, I know I respect them. Uh, we talk very openly about issues that are really difficult for the Department of Defense. Uh, and I think we're going to have to continue to do that. Now, one of the things that sequestration will drive is a very honest discussion about what are the military capabilities required for the United States of America to have the options it needs in the future. And wherever those priorities are, that's where we should invest. Yeah, I, I, I have to not like General Odierno because he's a Yankees fan, but I try to keep that tame because he, <laughs> he, he, he does have that Army thing. Um, how are we doing for questions out here? We want to show some hands right here in the middle. We'll bring a microphone to you. Identify yourself. And I guess I shouldn't say fire away with the general up here, right? <laughs> First of all, thank you for being here, sir. And uh, more importantly, thank you for your service and for your wife's service, which is equally important. Um, uh, my name is Pamela Pereski. I'm a civilian, and I work for you, and I work for everyone here who's American. Um, I'm an adjunct and research professor at the Air Force Academy. Um, I also work with women veterans through the Veterans Initiative at the Aspen Institute, so I have the honor and, and privilege of working with some of the most committed and courageous people I've ever met. Um, as a civilian, I have the opportunity to hear and be involved in conversations about the military that military people don't hear. Um, and I have the opportunity to be involved and participate in conversations with the military that most civilians don't hear. Um, and I am struck by the divide. Um, how important is bridging that divide, and what is the Air Force doing? Yeah, Pamela, thanks. It's a great question. Thanks for remembering Betty in your comment. I appreciate that. Um, 
the first thing we have to do, in my view, in the Air Force is we have to reintroduce America to its Air Force. Because I believe there's a certain ambivalence about the Air Force in the country, not because nobody likes us, but because they really don't know everything we do. And it's easy to get disconnected. Um, you know, one of the things I really admire about the Marine Corps, but my, by the way, I have a son. Betty and I's son, Matt, is a second lieutenant uh, in, in the Marine Corps. He's on his way to infantry officer school. Um, and he loves everything about it. And I love the fact that Jim Amos is his commandant. Uh, because I know the leadership he's going to get, an example he can follow. Um, but what, one of the things that's interesting about uh, this disconnect is, is that we don't communicate well across all these lines. With me today I have, let me ask three people to stand up real quick. Isaac Bell, stand up please. Jason Yaley, stand up please. And Megan Schaefer, stand up please. The guy on the left is Major Isaac Bell, who's an F-15E pilot. I hired him actually while he was flying combat missions in Afghanistan. He wasn't very good at that, by the way. <laughs> Actually, he was fantastic at that, but he much prefers to, uh, you know, carry my briefcase. <laughs> Next to him is Mr. Jason Yaley, who's a GS-15, a colonel equivalent in our Air Force. Young guy, you'll notice, really a talented guy, an Air Force civilian. And next to him is, is Major, and as of today, Lieutenant Colonel Select, Megan Schaefer. <laughs> Megan is a public affairs officer and just promoted two years below the zone, by the way, so she's a really good public affairs officer. But this is our Air Force. And, and this, I mean, this is our Air Force. We can't operate without any of those, the support team, the, the, the civilian airmen, or the guy on the front end of the combat business. You know that. And that's the message we have to continue to tell. And one of the things I'd like to do by doing this Reintroducing America to its airmen is include that story in it. It, the worst part about furlough, in my mind, to me personally, it's a breach of faith. You've, you've served as honorably and as long and as well, maybe not as long, as well as I have. You don't deserve this. There's reasons for it. I do believe it was inevitable if we wanted any capability to respond to contingency, but that's just crazy. Thanks for the question, Pam. Sir. Bring a mic around. Hang on just one. There he comes. Thank you. Stuart Bernstein, former American ambassador, and my respect for the military is just unbelievable. Thank you. Thank you uh, I know there's only so much you can say about this, but if Iran doesn't come around and we have to go in and strike, what kind of technology do we have if those are, these nuclear weapons are really deep down? And uh, can you share with us how this might happen or how it would work? <laughs> I got, I've got wireless if you want to pull up the plan. <laughs> if I said niet, would you understand my Russian? <laughs> everything, everything the United States military does is designed to go after difficult problems, difficult places, and difficult people. Uh, so we have worked hard at trying to have solutions available to all kinds of problems. And I'm hoping if this starts, we'll have something available for this one. Maybe the Death Star. You've been wondering if we had that, haven't you, Ben? <laughs> well, I can't tell you. <laughs> when are you running for what? <laughs> I'll tell you the solution really that. to any problem in the world is send Bill McRaven just by himself. <laughs> but, but, I mean, yeah, yeah, Bill, stand up for a second. <laughs> Please. And I know that Admiral Eric Olson, his predecessor in Special Operations Command, is also here. Admiral Olson, would you stand up for just a second? Oh, there you are. <laughs> Thank you, sir. Uh, you know, these these are uh, they're they're brilliant men. They're great politicians. They operate in lots of different circles. They're very cultured, but down deep, these are killers. <laughs> that that uh, I, that's not a joke. <laughs> That was the general's polite way of saying you yeah. might want to rephrase the question when they're up here. Yeah. <laughs> I took Bill's advice. He, you know, he opened this thing up last year, so I watched the video and talked to him briefly and said, what did you do to get ready? And he said, well, like a normal day, I, uh, I did my workout in the morning. You know, I ate a bag of protein. And so I, I did. I got up this morning. I, I ran for two or three hours, and I ate a bag of protein. And I, might have, I might have dreamed. I might have been dreaming the running part, Bill. <laughs> it might have been a bag of Tostitos, but it, <laughs> it was closed. All right. Over here. We've got two, ma'am. You go here, and then we'll go back. 
General, it's an honor to have you here. Um, my husband is Colonel Trey Sickbreed in the 138th Fighter Wing in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and he's very disappointed he can't be here this evening. Um, you said two things that have really struck home to us, and this uh, sequestration has really been an issue in Tulsa. We have 1,000 employees, only about 35 pilots, and everybody else supports the pilots. Um, First, I'd like to ask you, as you've grounded flyovers, as you, you made the comment of the Air Force getting disconnected from the average person, so as we become less, as the Air Force becomes less visible, how do we stay connected? And you also introduced these three fine, amazing young people. How do you keep attracting the best and the brightest if lying out ahead could be a furlough or a modernization that's not fulfilled or medical bills that can't be paid. It, this is the real life. We've done nine deployments in our unit and it, we are very blessed. They are less than two months, but um, two, those two questions. And then my son asked, um, having grown up every year, I mean, every month, once a month, our, our dad goes, we have four kids, he goes to drill. So it affects our family, this is our life. He said, how does the press and the media affect how the Air Force does its business and its ability to receive the funding um, you feel is necessary? I, I don't think the press and the media, let me go backwards on these, affect it as much as our ability to tell our story clearly. And if we tell it clearly, then I think people will understand and then the decision makers can make the right decision for the country. I think that's true for all the services and for the department as a whole. Um, as far as, uh, by the way, I, I, I kind of wish I could be where your husband is occasionally and be a part of the 138th Fighter Wing. <laughs> it might be more fun day to day. Um, but he, one of the great things about our Air Force, I, we mentioned the, the, the total force briefly there, but we've got 690,000 men and women who serve in, in all three components of our Air Force. And we can never be a strong Air Force without a strong reserve component. Uh, I think one of the things we're going to see over time is the way we stay connected to America and the places where we stay most connected are in the areas around our Guard and Reserve units because they're civilian airmen who come and come to work, live in the community, stay closely connected. Many of them have lived and in, in worked there and have family members who lived and worked there for years. Uh, so we're actually better in those communities than we are anywhere else, and we have to figure out how to take that strength and expand it. Uh, the same thing's true of the, of the political strength of the Air National Guard. That should be a strength for the United States Air Force. We've kind of turned it into the opposite, and we have to fix that. We're trying very hard to do that. Uh, the thing we have to make sure that we understand in the total force is, is how respected and required each component of it is. Uh, over time, as we shrink budgets, we are going to have to downsize our force to be affordable and credible in the future. And one of the ways we can make it more affordable is to move more into the reserve component because it's cheaper. It just is. And so we're looking at every option we can think of in that regard. You can't put it all there, but, but you can move some more in there. And we're looking hard at where the limits are because we have to examine that. We've got to be serious about it. Uh, we have an unbelievable commitment from the Air National Guard and Air Force Reserve. For the last 22 years now, our Air Force has been deploying to the Middle East. Our people don't know anything else. And the same thing is true for our reserve component. And they've been doing it on a volunteer basis and supporting that for 22 years. It's a phenomenal commitment by them, by their employers, by their families. Thank you for serving. Yeah, another question back over here. We've got about five or six more minutes. I'll try to motor through if we can. We've got a microphone. Here. Sir, you go here, and then we'll come back to you, ma'am, back there. Thank you, sir. Uh, sir, uh, Representative Hank Naughton, I'm a member of the uh, State House of Representatives in Mass, where I chair the Committee on Homeland Security, so really came here uh, to see what I can learn about uh, after the Boston bombings. But this question is wearing my hat as an Army reservist of uh, multiple deployments. I thank your wife. I know what my wife's been through with uh, four children at home. And recently returning from a deployment to Kandahar as a legad to an SFAT team, and I hope this doesn't get too far into the weeds, sir, and I can talk to you offline, but on the technology aspect and the lag in technology and of uh, real-time ISR information going from our ground forces uh, up, up the chain through our talk, through, 
through predators, and uh, it's, it's an issue, sir. And uh, I, I, as I said, I don't want to get too far into the weeds on it, but if you could comment on that and, uh, and where sequestration may take that. And we've still, as of today, we still have uh, about 16 months left in Afghanistan, and, uh, and that's an issue. We're Thank still you, flying 60-plus orbits of remotely piloted aircraft in the Middle East today. Uh, that, that adds up to about 1,200 hours a day of full motion video. Uh, the ISR capacity and capability that this country brings is phenomenal. The requirement is phenomenal -er. There's a requirement for more. Uh, the cost is also significant. The first 21 orbits of remotely piloted aircraft that the Air Force put into play back in 2006 cost us $55 billion. We now have 65 orbits. Uh, the cost is not insignificant. And as we look to the future, one of the things we have created is a mismatched ISR force. The Air Force is responsible for strategic level ISR and theater level ISR. Uh, the Army, Navy, Marine Corps all build organic capability to support their maneuver units, and I think we're all comfortable with that arrangement. But we weren't asked to build the theater level ISR until we were in the middle of the conflict. And so that, that's why we were lagging behind, and we've done everything possible to catch up. Uh, by the way, the term drone we don't like because there's nothing unmanned about what we're doing with remotely piloted aircraft. Uh, there's a huge infrastructure behind them. Um, and so one of the things we have got to do is make sure we clearly know as we move forward what is the requirement and who is going to pursue it. Um, we're looking at what is the best bang for the buck in the future for ISR for all combatant commanders, not just for direct support to an, a maneuver unit on the ground, which is part of the problem, but not the whole problem, especially if you're in other combatant com other parts of the world. And so we're trying to balance that right now. I, I completely understand it's not where it needs to be, but it might not ever be if just the Air Force is providing it to the unit level. That's really not the only role we play. It's not what the combatant commanders look to us for everywhere outside of Afghanistan today. And so that's the balance we're trying to walk, and I'd love to talk to you more about it later. It's a great topic. Thank you, sir. In the, in the white sweater in the back there, and I just wanted to observe, Red Sox Nation is infiltrated across Thank the you. room. Uh, <laughs> uh. Thank you, General. Uh, I, I was very glad to hear about your great concern about uh, sexual assault in the Air Force, but the only thing that I was concerned about is when you said that nobody cares more than uh, the commanding officers about uh, sexual assault. But what if the perpetrator is the commanding officer? I mean, one of the things that, of course, deters women from reporting sexual assault is actually fear of intimidation sometimes from somebody in greater authority who is a menace to her. So if she's having to report that person you know, to the very command that is, that is harassing her, that is a very fearful situation for a woman to be in and does deter her from reporting it. Yes, ma'am, I completely agree with you. Uh, there are lots of options to report sexual assault in all the military services. You don't have to go to your, your commander. There are, min there are many avenues available to you other than that. Uh, the danger, though, for the victim, it, it, because those other reporting avenues will not remove the fact that your commander will find out that you made the report. That's the difficulty. Um, I, I can't defend the, the fact that any commander who commits sexual assault is a, is a heinous criminal and deserves to be put away for life. I agree with you. I would agree with you wholeheartedly on that. And I'd love to lead the prosecution. Um, and it's happened, but it does not happen very often. Uh, the, what, what I mentioned was that the characterization that commanders writ large don't care about this problem or sweep it under the rug is simply not true. It's just not true. It's probably happened. I don't know of a case in the Air Force where it's happened, and we've been looking uh, because I, I want to make sure that's not an issue. But, but anecdotally, I know it's occurred. But institutionally, we have lots and lots, thousands of commanders in our services, and they do not all do that. Sir, right here. We'll take one or two quick more. No one's throwing things at me yet, so I think we can sneak a few more in. Here we go. Thank you. Mel Estrin, Washington, D.C., and thank you, sir, for uh, all you do for our country. Something you said raised a question uh, in my head, which goes back to the sequester that's going on, which is a, supposed to be a percentage of the increase that was supposed to happen in the budget and did not, and that the status of our readiness and our equipment and everything else would imply that we have been relatively underfunding our services going back, I think you said, to 2001. Is that actually the status that's happening and has been going on for all this time? 
And another a part of it is, if it was left to you and the men in your service, could you make the cuts better and in a more positive way for the service and our country than the straight across the board is happening and, and leave our service uh, in a much better condition? Uh, sorry, I, I, I think what's happened over the last 10, 12 years is we've been very busy. Um, and when you have trouble reducing cuts, uh, funding in some areas and you get busier, the, the problem gets more pronounced. Uh, I, our, our job is not to decide how big the United States military should be. But I'll tell you this, if somebody told us we need you to save a trillion dollars over 10 years, this is not the way we'd go about doing it. We would build a different game plan to ramp down to that level, to ramp to that level of savings. Uh, so yes, we would do it differently. Uh, I understand how the mechanism came into place. I understand what the impact of it is today. I don't know anybody, well, very few people, who think it's a good idea, that this mechanism is a good idea. It's just very difficult to figure a way out of where we are. But we would do it differently if we had the choice. And differently might still create the same level of savings, but the military would do it in a different way, and we would look very different 10 years from now than we had planned to look 10 years from now. But that's okay. We just need to clearly identify the risk we're accepting as we downsize. The nation gets to make that decision, not us. Okay. Sir, in the back, we'll take two over here, and then we'll have to wrap up, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. Sir, go ahead. Great, sir. Uh, so when you described the, oh, maybe I should, all right, here we go. Christopher Alberg from Recorded Future. So when uh, you described the threat uh, regarding sort of going from fourth to fifth generation fighters, that sounds pretty uh, linear, sort of you sort of manage the Gantt chart and you get through it. What's the threat that is not sort of following the Gantt chart that keeps you awake? that terrifies you, mm -hmm. external threat. Yeah, I think right now the biggest one for all of us is, is understanding the potential impact of threats in the cyber domain over time. I think there's some threats also to operations in space that are significant that we have to be concerned about. Uh, it, it's it's high-end, uh, technologically capable countries that are doing it. It's no secret who they are. Uh, and we have got to make sure we understand what their investment is creating and what it means to us over time. Those are the ones that, that we worry about the most. The, the biggest threat of what's going on today was kind of referenced um, by the, the lady whose husband is in the, in the guard the fighter unit. And, and that's that we've got people in the Air Force today who, are, who came in to fly airplanes and, and they're sitting. We've got people who came in to fix airplanes and their airplanes aren't breaking because they're not flying, so they don't fix them. We've got people who for the last 20, 22 years have been really engaged in, in defending the interests of the nation. They're very proud of who they are and what they do and they want to remain the best in the world at it. And they want to know that we are going to educate them, train them, and allow them to be at the cutting edge of this business. Even if we get smaller, the ones who stay want to be challenged. And if they don't feel that way, they'll walk. Our, our Air Force is about people like the three I introduced to you. It's about a young guy who I, I met in, uh, I would guess I was in Kuwait last year, and Betty and I were eating lunch in a chow hall, and we ran into a guy named Mohammed McMedovich who was from, really, who was from Serbonicia originally. He was born in Serbonicia in 1989. It struck me because my daughter Elizabeth was born in 1989. And while she grew up in a pretty stable family environment with lots of friends and people who loved her and supported her, Muhammad, at age three, took to the hills with his family after the, the enemy came into Serbonicia and started killing people, 8,000 people, pretty quickly. So he and his father and all the other male members of his family and of his village ran into the hills to try and escape. Their house was destroyed by a tank shell, so they couldn't go back there even when they returned to the area. Uh, the, the farms that had crops to feed them were all destroyed. Uh, the livestock was all killed off so they couldn't be used to feed these people. And from 89 to 92, Mohammed Mikhmedovich basically survived from age three to six on the run with his father and his uncles. In 92 to 95, they started to settle down in the hills before they eventually moved to Tuzla. But because of the starvation that was now entering the population of, uh, at that time, Bosnian Muslims, because of this effort to keep them uh, from settling in any one place so the military could find them on the move, the only thing that kept him and his family alive, according to this young airman who was 20 years old, uh, is the airdrops of food and medical supplies from U.S. Air Force C-130s. In, 19, in 2002, I guess, he came to the U.S., relocated to St. Louis under a program that allowed refugees with no homes to do that. He was sponsored by a family there that had gotten to the States earlier, and his mom, his dad, and his, and his one remaining uncle joined him. 
80% of his extended family had been killed. He joined U.S. schools in the eighth grade. He learned English within a year. and He decided his freshman year of high school that he owed something to the United States of America. And so when he graduated from high school, he enlisted the United States Air Force. He's an air transportation journeyman at Little Rock Air Force Base. He wanted to do that because those guys rig airdrop pallets, which is what he's doing today in Kuwait. His dream is to get a degree in the United States Air Force because of the benefits, educational benefits available. Once he gets a degree, he wants to go to officer candidate school, and he wants to become an airlift pilot in our Air Force. And what he'll tell you is that in the Air Force, every job matters and every person makes a difference. And people in this Air Force kept him alive, and he wants to keep others alive. This Air Force is great because we got people like that in it, and he's in it because this Air Force is great. It's a wonderful circle. If we break that circle of trust with our people, we've got a problem. Everything else will work its way out because they'll solve it. So to me, that's the biggest danger. I think I'm going to end on that note. That's a wonderful place to end that circle. General, I want to thank you. I want to thank the general for his time. I want to thank you all for your patience. And I know I didn't get to a couple of the questions before the staff grabs you. You might be able to grab them coming off the stage. Thank you all very much.